welcome, 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 folks. I see a lot of uh, folks trickling in as Zoom lets you all in. We're so excited that you're here. So my name is Amber Trout. I'm from Community Science, from the Organizational Effectiveness Focus Area. And I'm excited to be your host and journey person a part, uh, for this exciting panel discussion today. I share that because it's a journey and we really hope this is interactive and we have fantastic panelists with us here today. Uh, what I wanna say is what we really hope to talk about is build upon what you all were talking with us last week is really what does it take to move an organization through for equitable change? Equity could be the focus and the end goal of what you're doing or equity is the vehicle you're using to deepen your mission and your impact. We'll also talk about managing your equity and your change management practices in different contexts, right? You have different demands happening on you, different political uh, and social environments that everyone exists in. And it also really depends. Are you an internal driver to your change or an external driver trying to influence folks to change? And today, as part of part two, we're really focusing on those uh, critical conditions that help move an organization through. But first, to our new friends, just a quick plug that this is community science. We're really roaring towards equity. We see that as essential into the research evaluation and strategy development that we all do. And more importantly, here's the fantastic panel that will be uh, sharing their wisdom uh, and how they have moved organizations through, walked with organizations and how to keep going when, even when it seems like the peaks and valleys are, are endless. Also wanted to share to those who weren't with us last week, an overall vision of change management. Is it really, I am here and I wanna to go to the end? No, not really. It's like reading a roadmap and the road's going so fast that you miss your on-ramp to, or your off-ramp on a freeway and you're like, oh no, where do I go? So we know it's not linear. We also know, we were talking last week, it's critical to have a navigation, a guide to walk you through the different stages because we know it's not a straight arrow and that it's iterative. Sometimes it's to the left, to the right, or all the way around. And for us, that looks like building awareness. Where am I at? Where do we want to go? Getting organized. What capacities do we need? What are the inequities we think we want to change? And how does that help us change the mission? To start implementing who's responsible for what? by when and how do we know it's it's happening? What do we feel differently for who? What are we experiencing? And more importantly, the communities we're a part of, how is their uh, realities changing? And then sustaining the efforts. How do you sustain the effort of your equity change given your environmental context and the history, your organization's context and its history, as well as building your capacity? So last week we really focused on how equity looks different at the different stages of change, how it evolves, where do you want to go, and is that realistic for your organization? From understanding the historical impacts to defining those measurements to then building processes to support your vision and goals to happen at the everyday level. So every org function, every person understands how that equity goal translates in their daily interactions and then commitment the people power, the financial power, and aligning on that common purpose. But for these amazing people, we're gonna focus on what are the essential organizational conditions? Specifically, we heard you, what is implementable? Not only cerebral, how do I get past the building awareness and into implementing? So that's where we're focusing today. And we really appreciate you all sharing information before and even during this. So the chat, the Q&A is at the bottom of this screen and you can uh, feel free to submit questions throughout this. All right, panelists, are you ready to go? I'm going to start sharing my screen. I'm going to ask each of these uh, equity drivers to introduce themselves, and then we'll jump right in with the first question. Do you mind kicking us off, Gian? Yeah. Hi, everyone. It's good to be here. I'm Gian Gallo-Cohn, she, her pronouns. Um, I'm the Senior Associate for Race, Equity, and Inclusion at the Vera Institute of Justice. Um, we call it REI, um, that's Vera's kind of DEI arm, and we start with race very intentionally because that is the primary indicator of how folks kind of fare in America. Um, the Vera Institute of Justice, our goal is to um, 
and the overcriminalization and mass incarceration of people of color, immigrants, and people experiencing poverty. And so our equity work that is done largely internally um, has been ultimately to try to be responsive to these communities that we work with and support. Um, again, our work has been largely internal, but we're trying to shift to help staff operationalize equity so that it is um, an equity lens is applied to our projects, our programs, um, and our relationships that we are building. Happy to be here. Awesome. Linda. Well, great. And thanks, Amber. Appreciate the invitation. Linda Gonzalez Chavez. I lead our global diversity, equity, and inclusion work for YMCA of the USA. There's actually YMCAs in 120 countries across the globe. And uh, we have over 750 YMCAs across the US that serves more than 10,000 communities. Each of those organizations is autonomously governed and managed. And so much of the work that we're doing is in partnership with these local YMCAs. Uh, and the exciting thing around some of our global work now is as we further discuss our contextual journeys, but some of the work that we're doing with our overseas YMCAs or international YMCAs as we journey collectively in diversity, equity, and inclusion through a very intersectional lens. But it's a real opportunity to be able to sit here and share with these great leaders. So thank you for inviting me to the panel. Alex, you're rounding us out and starting us, well, that will start us off. Do you mind sharing a little about yourself and your organization? Sure, Amber, thank you. And I, like my other um, fellow panelists, I'm really excited to be here and part of this conversation. I'm Alex McRae. I use the he series pronouns, and I'm currently serving in two roles here at Philanthropy Massachusetts as we go through a leadership, executive leadership change. Um, so I am serving as interim co-executive director of Philanthropy Massachusetts alongside my colleague, Jessica Burns, as well as vice president of member engagement and strategic initiatives at Philanthropy Massachusetts. I've been here for going on seven years or so now. And I, I was saying this earlier, though um, my role um, is uh, the most explicit when it comes to integrating and weaving in race, equity, diversity, and inclusion, by no means does that work sit only with me. Um, so I come from, um, or I'm using both an internal and an external uh, lens when thinking about this work because like the why, um, we work in partnership um, with a ton of funder institutions as well as nonprofits throughout the Commonwealth, the state of Massachusetts. So uh, we have about 160 or so funder members and about 400 active nonprofit, nonprofit members. And our mission um, is to promote the practice and um, expansion of effective philanthropy. So I'm happy to be here. Awesome. Linda, thinking about equitable change and supporting other organizations to make that change, what have you seen as a supporter, right? You can't tell uh, local wise what to do. What are some of the challenges that also facilitators when thinking about designing and implementing your organizational trade strategy uh, to advance equity? Do you mind sharing yeah. some thoughts? Sure, absolutely. I would say context, context, context. Each mm -hmm. local Y is so different and so unique. What we do at the national office is ensure our frameworks, which are highly participatory in development, very engaged with folks from across the country, across the globe in several of our situations, so that folks are able to, to organize their work in a way that we're able to trek up impact so that we're still singing off the same song sheets, et cetera, but that we're working with each of those YMCAs as they address the most pressing needs of their communities, including in the DEI space. Uh, one of the things that we've been really proud of in our global work has been each of our leaders, are uh, their indigenous folks to the communities that they're serving. Each Y is uh, autonomously governed and managed. Um, and so we're also able to lean into some very authentic voices. I think a platform for us that really supported our overall uh, portfolio was intersectionality, 
we have a very uh, a, a very very comprehensive uh, diversity will of which we're really able to start looking at all the various intersections that folks are uh, addressing and where some of those demographics end up addressing so many inequities and when inequities are elevated up through the lens of community is a way that we can really keep the work going. I would say one of the strengths of our uh, strategy is the direct engagement with our communities and our local YMCAs so that there's a constant conversation happening and establishing what we call our safe spaces, our brave spaces, so that we're able to have the conversations in a way that isn't threatening, in a way that actually allows for diversity of perspectives to be had, and a way for us to also start looking at the most important things for us to measure, because so much of our work is also a constant evolution of tweaking and retweaking and making sure that we are addressing all the things that really come up in an average day of, a, of, of local Y leaders. Uh, I would say another thing that has really supported this work is the mission of the YMCA. The fact that we have, uh, have ensured that every Y in the country, especially, is welcoming and engaging, and they're committed to our, our overall commitment to welcoming all. The mission of the YMCA's core values is also a way, as this conversation can oftentimes become politicized, that we're able to keep it central to the ethos of what the YMCA is. So as you look at our history, we've been an organization that has not always been inclusive, but we've been able to open that inclusion door and incredibly it, from this day on, ensure that others are opening those inclusion doors so that we are addressing those most marginalized, those most underserved. And then the fact that we're looking at our own organization to ensure that our organizations, that our policies, our practices, our procedures are also in line with our equity work and the expectations that our communities have of us as an evolving organization that's really about partnering and serving community. And that means that we also have to be nimble enough to change and adapt as communities are also changing and adapting. Well, I, I appreciate you sharing what I heard you say, a clear framework for people to plug in. So you've had those conversations and the yep. framework is defined by that mission, right? Yep. And, and then those, yep. And focus areas, the focus areas. I mean, even if we start looking at some of the work that we're doing to ensure that New, we can use one example, right? The inequities that our newcomers and immigrants are facing on a day basis. But we're able to go in there and we have a very robust framework for how we engage newcomer and immigrants um, from capacity building tools all the way to measurement tools, as, as all the way to partnerships that you're able to opt into. But each of those communities that are opting in are working on, say, for example, welcoming newcomers and immigrants in the YMCA but that can look very differently across the country. We're talking specifically about the United States and they'll be serving different immigrant groups. So we keep it flexible enough that they're able to customize uh, the work to address again, the folks that they're most uh, focused on serving. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Alex, what I'm wondering if you could share about the, the, the barriers and the facilitators but what about that framework? So Linda's talking about that framework. How did you all approach your work to know where you want to go? And then selecting those strategies uh, to keep the movement forward. Once that vision is there, how did you, how are you thinking through making it a real thing that everyone on your team and the members of your association want to be part of? Yeah, Amber, that's a great question. <laughs> So, I mean, as you well know, just um, from community science, you were, you and your team were really instrumental in working with us as a membership organization that serves, I can relate to what Linda was just saying about being responsive, um, context matter matters, because funder institutions, right, it can be corporate, it can be private, family or non-family, it can be public, a community foundation they all have different structures and systems in place um, that warrant us as the connector, as the convener, 
as the one who's hosting more than 100 programs on both the funder and the nonprofit side in terms of building awareness. Um, having, um, being able to reach people where they are is really key for us, right? We're responsive and we lead with values, just like, right? Like equity is central to what we're, what we're doing and what we hope to do in the world. As a regional association, um, we're one of many across the country. And so we can tap into other organizations like ours as we continue to learn um, and again, reach both funders and nonprofits where they are. Um, some of the barriers or resistance, right, is how do you maintain that commitment? And I say all the time, it's a long-term commitment. I say that to the board. I say that to the team. Like, yes, there's momentum back in 2020 and, you know, some of that remaining today. But like, what if there is no momentum? Then what do you do? We still care about centering and advancing equity and inclusion and having diverse voices at the table. Um, and so again, just community science, you were you were extremely helpful in helping our uh, working group, which we developed, um, co-develop a plan that has a number of strategies that are built over time, right? Um, so we're I'm, I'm really excited about that and recognize that we're at the beginning in some ways, even though we've been talking about this for some time, in some ways, we're kind of returning to the beginning in order to build a stronger base to move forward with. And again, that's being as inclusive as possible, really listening, really understanding, um, and really tapping into what is that desired state of philanthropy? Right. We asked our members, what do you want to see? <laughs> um, and really helping them, supporting them and trying to achieve that state, that ultimate vision, because we can't. There's no way we can do it by ourselves. So. I really appreciate what I hear is the co-development and understanding that desired state, because that's where the buy in and making it building the inertia to keep going through when there isn't momentum. I really uh, want to double click on that. Um, and how to make sure people see themselves in it. And what you're saying, it's not linear. I mean, even the graphic we started with is is misleading. It's circular. So there was a phase, and I hear you mentioning, it's almost like the fatigue just to get to, what do we want to do? To regroup, rejuvenate with what I hear you saying, Alex, and then go through again. Now, what can we do now that we have that vision and we know who we're walking with on that journey? into the group, I'm going to come back to everyone after Gian. Well, what do we mean by meeting people where they're at? What, what does that mean? And how do you meet people at various stages of equity? It's new to them. Uh, they're not clear how it contributes to the organizational mission, right? Um, and those that are already bought in and like, let's go, keep going. So just to give a minute for folks to think about, then going to Gian, you're in an organization. So we're hearing about providing frameworks, co-designing together, you're tasked with let's go and helping uh, staff and the leadership team and all the different organizational functions implement that desired state you all agreed upon. So I was wondering if you could share some of your lessons learned of what are some challenges and facilitators when you're trying to move an organization through. Yeah, a lot of what Linda and Alex said really resonates, um, especially the non-linear function of equity work. It is kind of lifelong for individuals, but also a really long-term commitment for organizations. Um, Vera's equity work started about seven-ish years ago now, but it has been through a lot of iterations. So first it was kind of led by staff um, whose full-time job was not equity work. And then it was pushed through and we became a, a department. And so now we're kind of working, we have to go back and kind of do that initial groundwork and lay a foundation and figure out what do we mean by equity? Why are we doing this? How does it connect to our mission? Um, and over the last four years, the REI department at Vera, we've really tried to, to move from that talking phase into the implementation phase. Um, one way we've done this is through 
we had an action plan that was implemented for two years from 2021 until summer of last year, 23. Um, these were 35 like high level actions that really helped Vera become more equitable over the span of two years. Um, all of the actions had a um, an accountable department. So for example, human resources kind of took accountability for a few of the actions. The race equity and inclusion department did, development team did, and then programs did as well. And so that was really helpful for a accountability for the whole plan and how we saw our REI work going in the next two years or in the two years, but then also how to stay on track and hold each other accountable um, in that space. Um, one of the hardest things about doing this work is creating these kind of accountability bodies and mechanisms. And so we do have a committee on our board of trustees um, specifically um, for REI. And so they have been great at kind of being the equity champions for um, the rest of the board. And it sends a signal and message to our organization that, that we do care and we are committed. Um, we also have a committee, a staff committee um, on REI. And so those folks are a diverse group of about 21 folks um, across the organization. And we're an organization of about 250, almost 300 people um, nationally. And so um, folks are remote, work in different cities um, at different levels. Um, and they've been really helpful in kind of being the eyes and ears for us who is a two to one person department um, who can't see everything. Like we're not really on the ground with our programs, but we do our best to have those touch points to really help folks um, operationalize again equity. Um, and then, yeah, one of the, the hardest things also is that that shifting from, okay, we kind of understand collectively what equity is and what we mean by that, but now how do we, um, how do we apply these values and these lenses to the work that we're doing, again, to end the over-criminalization of mass incarceration? Um, and so that's been a really big challenge and it's slow work and it's hard when this work is really fast, when the work that people are doing is fast and we're reacting to a lot of laws and a lot of just backlash now and helping to, and there's a sense of urgency in the field. And so we're trying to combat that, but at the same time, make sure that we're pushing ahead and folks know and feel that they, that they're heard. Um, and then that goes into the question ever you were saying about where meeting people where they're at. That's one of the biggest things that I try to do as REI and Vera, um, Meeting staff where we're at is also really important, not only community members. Community members, yes, and how we co-develop programs with them and how we make sure we're not kind of coming in and leading work or taking over work that's not even meant to be done or solving the wrong solutions, et cetera. But working with staff to like reach them where they're at. So like data people might need some numbers and might need that diversity report. But then facilitators might need that conversation and need that why behind why we're doing this. And so that's been really important along with kind of building those relationships internally and externally. What I love about your share is so powerful. What I heard about accountability. Yes, it's the term, right? It's thrown, it's thrown out there a lot, but you're operationalizing it. And that's not possible. What I hear with everyone without that, we're calling it desired state, but what are you working towards? What are you hoping is different? and to have, that's the horizon you're working through as a team. So when there's behaviors that, uh, that don't match that agreement or decisions that don't match the values, you're calling, you're calling folks into the vision and not out and saying you're a bad person. And you know, what I was loving, how you bridged to the ramps and interested Linda and Alex, what you were saying, the on-ramps and understanding, oh, this is a heart conversation. This is uh, a leading with the why, perhaps this is leading with data and balancing how do you keep moving through the urgency to address and still bringing people on. That could get lost if you don't know where you're trying to go, right? And I think perhaps mm -hmm. that could be where like when a computer's on and the wheel is circling and you all of a sudden you're frozen and you're like, where did, where did two years go? I feel like we're still in building awareness. And so I hear you saying multiple, there's multiple skills that you're holding, all of you with change. So Linda, I saw you on mute. Let's hear it. 
Uh, I was just saying perfectly stated, John, as far as examples of meeting people where they're at. People's lived experience oftentimes uh, requires that we meet them differently. And we really took back in, in some of our core trainings when we just start getting people comfortable with talking about their dimensions of diversity, we've really taken back this concept of ignorance and not fearing it, but rather leaning into it so that you learn what you don't know. And sometimes cross-cultural competence can happen just by folks from very different backgrounds and lived experiences sitting together in the same safe space conversation and sharing those. We find that, op that often people's exclusion is out of fear, it's out of ignorance, it's having never in ever engaged with the other that they are addressing or 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 not welcoming. So it's really asking those questions, meeting them where they're at, asking the 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 the, the oftentimes questions that have to come just to start the conversation. And that can be just some of the most basic. We understand that there are different communities across the country, for example, that are moving quicker in our equity work. We know that there's those that are moving slower, but we expect them all to be moving in the direction of, of foundational diversity, equity, and inclusion and to really start addressing it. We're finding that some of the greatest challenges have been the lack of opportunity for people to actually come together in these specific spaces to discuss equity. And so we look at the individual lens, but then we're also holding ourselves accountable on the organizational side to how we make progress in our DEI work, in our commitment work as an organization. And so as Gian was stating, you know, meeting our staff at different spaces, our our local YMCA CEOs, the boards of directors. I mean, oftentimes it's about having a conversation with the board of directors that had never considered, for example, welcoming a newcomer young person into our into our child care programs, or ensuring that LGBTQ plus youth feel safe at camp and feel welcome to camp. Like, how are we able to move into all of those particular spaces? And I would say that that would be the other areas. We look at the individual, the organizational, and then the greater societal commitment that we have that leads us to committing uh, over and over again to the long journey of our equity work. Because as we look at communities, as we're looking at the communities that the YMCA serves today, it is so important for us to reflect what those communities look like, but also understand those communities. And I encourage folks always look to where the greatest pain points are. Where is the greatest exclusion? Where is the greatest lack of access? How can we as an organization start looking collectively, not just at moving individuals, but starting to utilize the organization to change some of the, the inequities that are so embedded into what our communities face every day. So I, I would say it's the more that you, the more that you learn and hear about equity work, even sitting and talking to you all today, the more I, I the more my own lens opens up, the more I feel that I'm learning, the more things that I see where I've missed. And so it's that constant pursuit of your goals, but then the self and self-organizational evaluation of ensuring that we're listening to the voices, especially as we've seen over the last couple of four years or so, the, the dramatic societal shifts that we're doing. And when you start looking at like the core part of the technical side of, of organizational diversity, equity, inclusion, it's just how you start the conversation, Amber. It is a change development process. It is organizational change. And as we've seen historically, how we need to open up the inclusion doors to ensure that our society has equal access, those are the kind of things that, again, you can you can just continue to evolve and to learn. Uh, what, I, what I love about community science and these spaces that we're in, it's, it's always like seeking, seeking new truths and new perspectives rather than stopping at an absolutist space where you feel that you found your truth and there's no more truth to find. You're done. Which, is, <laughs> which, is, which you're never done. Never done. And you're bringing in, so with accountability becomes learning, right? Oh, okay, Absolutely. I've learned these are not the behaviors 
This is uh, a new person I haven't interacted with, new people, part of the community. So what I hear is there's a learning. And another way to think about is data, right? The data yes. to understand, hey, th these are the communities we're trying to serve. These are the staff folks that are making the mission part of the reality and they're not included. And it's connected to deepening your impact. Yes. So I hear the balance of morals yes. and the business case to stay Absolutely. responsive. Yeah. Right. And that people feel like there's a belonging and buying in. And so, Alex, I was I was wondering, what are what does it mean for you? So there's the what we were where we started. Hmm, let me start that over again, <laughs> folks. where we were starting, which is the on ramps. How do you know you're sticking on your strategy? You're working with a group of people. What are you looking for with the funder organizations you're you're working with to know, OK, they're building momentum. What's in place? What are you hoping is in place? What kind of supports are you looking for? Basically, I'm trying to push us to be concrete so our friends online go, okay, I get it. Here's the next <laughs> steps. Uh, yeah. I appreciate you. Yeah, I mean, there was so much in what um, both Linda and Gian said. Um, and I want to start with just um, just reiterating some of what I heard in each of, 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 of what you each said. And that is, this connection between our personal selves and our professional organizational selves. Because my theory is, my premise is, until the person sees themselves themselves um, in the other, like in some other experience, it's really difficult for that person to rally around, to connect with the rationale, the why centering and advancing equity and inclusion and diversity is so important. Right, because they just don't connect themselves and their families and their communities to it. So I just, I just firmly believe that that's the case. So like for me, as a black person living in this country, like I have a lot to say about <laughs> yeah. the systems and the structures in place, and I feel comfortable speaking out about them. Part of why I'm in the role that I'm in is because philanthropy, with all the money, all the resources, the power, the decision making, the influence, I want to do my part to help shift the way folks in philanthropy who are in it making decisions every single day about investments, resource allocation. I want to be part of helping folks to think differently. Um, about various communities. And I just mentioned, you know, the African-American Black community. There are other identities too, but, you know, that I'm a part of. But like, that's part of why I'm in this. And though it's challenging and frustrating and there's tension and it's hard, I'm in it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm in it. So one thing I wanted to say about where we sit as, an, as a membership organization that has both funders and nonprofits, um, involved is we have clusters of funders. So easily 15 or 16 groups of funders by role, by geography, by identity, by issue area who have come together in a network. Those networks, our clusters, are places where we are leaning into and leveraging the power that's coming from like the collective action, the yep. collective learning. Community science, right? And, you know, with us really helped us to hone in on that's our way to influence funders because it's not just us, it's what are peer funders seeing um, amongst themselves because that's the other thing, right? <laughs> like yep. if a funder is doing something in a certain way, sometimes that can influence what another funder is mm -hmm. doing, no matter how much we, at Philanthropy Massachusetts want, you know, <laughs> something to change. Um, so that that cluster of funders, those intimate, safe, trusted spaces are critical to us um, centering and advancing equity and inclusion. They're huge. They're a big part of our ultimate set of strategies to move, to continue movement, basically. And so I just wanted to put in that plug for funder networks and cohort-based learning on on other sides of our business too. I'm just taking in the knowledge you just laid down, Alex. And I just what I what I Did I answer your question? 
Oh, you did. And we're going to keep going with it. What, what I hear you saying is, is the system lens, right? And so what I meant by hearing the knowledge that you laid down is yes, we meet people where they're at. We understand uh, the different perspectives. We have our eye, all of you are saying on that horizon. And what you're bringing is the role of decision-making. So then if what you're, the goal we want to work towards, what's getting in the way. And sometimes it might be surprising. It may not be what you assume is getting in the way for funders, for nonprofits, for individuals to buy in. Community science, we say people aren't resistors. There's resistant behaviors, right? And so my question to the group, I'm wondering, right? We're talking about a lot about meeting people where they're at, making sure you have your horizon and calling people in. And Alex, you, you started that with that decision-making. How do you know your strategy is really getting at the root cause? Because sometimes you could spend most of your time responding, but there's no chance or opportunity to lead to know that you're going to the root cause that's going to that reduce that inequity. Everyone uses the example, you, know, you hear about hunger, you could feed people or you could fix the system, make sure there's food available to people. And so when you're thinking about your strategies, right, so listen to people, make sure there's that leadership team, there's a horizon, the decisions uh, I heard Alex, you saying the cluster of people and how do you build momentum there? But you as drivers of this change, what are you internally or through your data helping be your guide to know we have some root cause system change levers we're also addressing through this change? Does that make sense? Does anyone want to jump in on this? I know it's a new question, so I don't want to direct it to anyone right away. I can start a little bit. So the root cause is always tough to figure out, but one of the big things that we try to do at Vera, at least with our staff and figuring out the root cause of um, what we need to resolve internally is we try to get there by listening to folks a lot. So really creating those spaces. I think Linda, you mentioned this for people to provide their feedback and for conversations to happen. That's when you really hear and see um, what the causes of things are. And even in those conversations, someone might be saying something and concerns with one policy, but that's not actually what they're genuinely concerned about. And so mm -hmm. even addressing these problems, sometimes it's not even about literally doing X, Y, and Z in the next five months, but it's about telling people or letting people know that like you heard them and you understand what they're getting at. And that you will at least work to address that, like what they're feeling. Um, and so sometimes it's not only about the literal um, policy changes that you make or um, practices that you enable. But another big part of that is um, those accountability mechanisms that I, were, that I was talking about before. So how do you have those like checks and balances internally? Um, and then some of the work that we do externally, we work with, I work with our, our teams to kind of help develop policies, work with stakeholders that they're working with externally. And then also how are they thinking about their theory of change or theory North Star goals for their programs? How are they working with these communities? And all of those questions are hopefully helping them kind of get at that root cause. So if we, if one program that we're trying to develop is around um, the bail system, we would want to work with folks who are doing that work on the ground right now and help to understand um, where VR can fit in. So not kind of coming in and saying, we want to do this, we think this is a solution, but coming in and saying like, oh, how, what is being done already? Where do you need our help? How can Vera help you do this work? And how can we all work together to advance that? equity yeah that's holding your the accountability what i hear not only internally but externally living into those values not assuming you have the answers or what you all see as the system play might be different to those living that linda i saw you unmute what are your what are your thoughts just in your question you know related to root cause as we're as we're working with our local ymcas and even as we're working at yusa it depends on the problems that we're trying to solve and what are the issues that the communities are having. And so oftentimes root causes have many different layers. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, you just, you find one cause after another cause and you keep going into that particular space. I think that 
I think that some of the work that we've done very intentionally around understanding histories and lived experiences have been really helpful for us. Uh, uh, again, um, from you know whether it be from a race perspective or a gender perspective, how we address the exclusions that have happened organizationally as well as in communities, and so looking at those, and then how we don't stop with just the analysis, but start moving into the solutions. Um, what Jian was stating, where you start looking at where are the conversations that need to happen, where do we start collectively working together to organize around these shared issues, conflicts, problems, how do we work at that? And then how do we bet, get better skilled at taking the individual experience, and this is what Alex was going on, uh, the path of introducing cohort experiences, Mm -hmm. And so working with cohorts, we um, what we've worked with you, Amber, in community science is our equitable communities work with a cohort process. And its intention was to move uh, individuals from their diversity, equity, inclusion journey and learning to start seeing how that gets applied organizationally. And that's what we're working on right now with that cohort. YMCAs from very diverse communities, very diverse parts of the country geographically spread out, but then again, utilizing the methods and the frameworks to start moving the organization so that we're not also um, repeating actions for individual problems that have not yet been discovered to be more broad-based or organizational. And so how do we start moving in those spaces? And some practical, you know, very practical things can come out of it. I know some of the early cohort work that we were doing around LGBTQ plus inclusion, um, much of our issues was when we started as an organization moving from family memberships to inclusive household memberships, for example. Mm -hmm. How something like that then can address some of the root problems for many folks that were trying to uh, access the YMCA, whether that be foster families, families living in low-income environments, grandparents raising children, all of those, all of those folks, where we were able to use their issues as a, a problem, but have a broader solution. It always reminds me of like for some of the DEI folks, is a big snowstorm you know, comes and you make sure that you're shoveling off the ramp rather than the stairs so that everybody can use that ramp. So those kind of ideas of how does, how does our equity work actually focus on specific dimensions of diversity? How do we start leaning into that so that we're becoming more accessible and more inclusive across multiple dimensions? That's a powerful example and image, uh, Linda, where it's, there's a mental model of what families look like and assumptions and that desired state that all families, different compositions and different yes. ways and different uh, ways of family can be networked together, have access to the wise to have healthy, thriving lives. And that also connects to the wise business model, right? To be a service, to be responsive, but also to uh, be able to generate revenue to keep providing these services. So it required understanding the lived experience, whatever you say was the data to understand where to put the focus. And I was wondering, is there strategies y'all have walked away from? Because sometimes there's strategies, you're like, this is the one, but is it the one for your organization to do? And I know Gian, you hinted at that in your response. So I was wondering, how do you discern this is the strategy that only my organization can do to contribute to advancing equity, either walking with people or our mission? I would say our constant evaluation, especially with the evaluation coming from the local wise that we're working with and the communities that we're working with. Of course, there's I can find numerous times where we had strategies that didn't work. Um, and we needed to, to, to move specifically, all types of them. But that's the beauty of keeping a nimble structure that is as much as can possibly be because of the different needs of different families. I mean, I can, I can give some, you know, core, you know, one would be is when we started looking at, um, you know, say, for example, increasing camp access to kids of color uh, uh, and 
that didn't necessarily work for all communities, right? It wasn't just about scholarshiping. From the case of like Hispanic Latinos, for example, uh, the families weren't trusting to send their children off to a, a YMCA camp. So they started looking at engaging Latino families more from a camp, a family camp process. For some of the new immigrants that had been coming from refugee camps, it was about explaining to, it wasn't about going in there and starting to talk about camps. We weren't recognizing how traumatic that word was for some folks that may have been living in refugee camps for untold amounts of years. And so how do we start looking at those particular things? So sometimes for us, it was about not getting out a broad message, but making sure it was understood more specifically. Yeah. Um, but I think that that nimbleness is really important for all organizations, especially as we continue to uh, address societal changes of all types. That And that hovers right over one of those critical, essential organization conditions, right? It's not about getting it right, but understanding the details to reach your staff, to reach the community members or the constituents you serve. So it's about the details to call people in to ensure that the services or the policy uh, are addressing the inequity that's impacting them. Right. And then that's also what I hear you saying is keeping your eye on the system play. Right. So you're hearing you're on ramping and you're keeping your eye. Folks need access to different camps or foods or resources in the community. And by being nimble, when another way I hear you saying is data to understand, be reflective and move. And I know, Alex, you wanted to jump in. Yeah, I just want to say a couple of things. I mean, one is just that I mean, I just want to go back to the funder networks that I had referenced earlier. Equity and the sort of um, operationalizing of equity, getting concrete, getting specific, um, getting as as um, related to that funder network as possible exists within a certain funder group. So I think of, say, um, the CFO network that we can be, right? Like they crowdsourced a vendor diversity list so that folks could be thinking of who are the folks um, working within the equity and inclusion space from a vendor perspective, so that when we're thinking about selecting our vendors, we have an eye towards a much more diverse and robust set of um, possibilities, right? So that's one specific concrete example of a crowdsourced vendor list that came from our CFO network, uh, funder network, but it's different across networks, behavioral health, right? Mm -hmm focused on health equity or food equity, right? Um, uh, it just depends on the particular, um, I would say, funder network when you think about those root causes, right? A group of education funders, right? Like what is the language, what's the communication that will resonate the most with them? For that group to understand what's the most important thing here? What are we driving towards? So it's really knowing the audience, quite frankly, knowing the audience, but also continuing to learn from the audience as your plan and your strategies um, change, right? Um, because again, going back to what Linda said, I mean, you can you can start with a certain set of strategies, begin to go down that path and learn that, oh, this actual, this either is going to take more or reassessing whether we're the right ones for it. And so we constantly ask ourselves, like, we sit in this kind of funny, interesting space, right? We're not on the ground. We're a couple steps removed from that being on the ground. So how do we get closer and closer to the ground, but then raising that awareness for both of our key stakeholder groups, funders and nonprofits. So again, we're it's just an interesting space to be in because we're trying to influence and we have a voice and at the same time, we want as many members as possible, right? It's so like, it's it's this balancing, it's a balancing act in, in a lot of ways. And at the same time, educating our 11 member staff and our 22 member board constantly as to what's our role, who are we, and returning to that at moments in time. This is a really good moment in time for us because we're going through, like I said, a leadership change. So a new leader, will come in with a vision and ideas, right? How does that get woven into current structures and or culture? 
uh, so that the organization continues to build and build and get better and stronger and all of that. Because it's a 54 year history. Right. Behind and us. It, right? and, a com and a common thread amongst all of you, there's listening, there's being engaged, but wh wh what's your role in the ecosystem? I also hear, does the ecosystem want you or understand your role to it? And then can you deliver on your promise if you're going to raise your set hand and say, yes, uh, we're part of this ecosystem. Here's what we can contribute. And part of uh, that is being willing to pivot, understand what you're, where you're going, but also being learning. Also, we've been spending a lot of time, well, if we meet people where we're at, we hear them, everything's great. We just learn and the momentum keeps going forward. But we know that not to be true, right? There's also moments where we're trying to live into the vision, but there's a misstep by a manager, by your organization when you're engaging with the community. Maybe someone who just doesn't want to participate in the vision. Then what? What does accountability look like there? How are you holding, um, perhaps I would say, resistive behaviors or an oopsie, right? It's someone with good intentions, but it was a blind spot that really shakes through your organization and your efforts. How do you hold folks accountable and keep momentum going in the direction? I don't know, Dion, if you wanted to share first. <laughs> yeah, um, that's a great question. I don't think there's one answer and there's not one size fits all for every organization or for um, even within organizations. And so one way that I think it's really important that you have those structures set up so that folks know how they can react and how they can have those conversations if and when those like oopsies or mistakes happen. Um, and so having that culture be one of learning, accountability, and um, moving forward and kind of calling in instead of out, that's kind of a a phrase that folks use, but that's really important. Um, but then we also have to consider, you know, how, again, it's all connecting back to the mission. So like, how are we as Vera? We grapple with this all the time. Like, okay, we get what equity is. I think most of us do. We try to like continuously help people learn and like grow in their own journeys and on their teams. But then what does it actually mean for us as Vera staff to do this work to transform the institutions that we are working in and how are societal um, breakdowns and inequities reflected back in mm. Vera and how are we interacting with each other to perpetuate that and so that's what we're trying to disrupt um, and you know when those mistakes happen sometimes they're called out sometimes they're not and they kind of bubble up and cause more problems but again, these bodies like staff committees, the board committee, you really want that holistic effort. And I think Alex said this at the beginning, but even though I'm a one person, two person team for REI, I really depend on everyone to try to advance equity and be that champion on their own teams or with their peers or with the partners that they work with. And so it's really my job is to help people understand how they do that on their own so that we can all do it together. And so that is really one of the biggest ways that you can kind of navigate that, but it it's not easy. It's not always going to work. You're going to mess up a lot. It's going to sometimes cause people to feel like they're, we're taking a step back or we're not doing anything or reacting or responding to people's um, concerns. But at the same time, I think even hearing concerns is an indication that um, we're doing something right. Yeah. I appreciate the vulnerability, just being transparent of, of what it's like in your response. And it, and it makes me go back to the essential conditions in your response. You were saying before, knowing doing new behaviors is not fun, right? Trying to incorporate workout into my work week it's not always fun. And I definitely do lots of judgments on that. But in your response, you there's the key structural components in place to metabolize when conflict or an effort right happened, but it didn't consider different uh, unintentional consequences that surface up, right? It may not be one time, but it's three or four that has this cluster effect that all of a sudden boils up. 
but there's the staffing committee, uh, there's how to have conversations, there's metrics that you're sharing in your response to help metabolize whatever feels like going backwards to almost full circle come forward, to keep going uh, forward with the work and going back to what all of you have been saying, why are we doing this in the first place? What's our mission? Who's it for? And just noting time and to wrap us up, I wonder if you all had thoughts of what do you do when it feels like it's backwards? What's your advice? Almost hopeful, like that hopeful goodbye to our friends. It feels like business as usual is seeping in and Gian's words, it's like that dominant normal ways of doing things are always, it's like water. It's always trying to come in to your new desired state. What makes you hopeful that you can overcome when it feels like you're settling back into business as usual and keep going forward? Does that make sense? I mean, I would say consistency for us has really been important. So having those consistent touch points and really being available to staff and folks and helping when you can, and it's not all external or it's not all, look what we did, we published this report every other week, but it's really building those relationships and again, maintaining that consistency and which expresses the commitment and the and kind of the why. Linda. I would say, it, Gian, I completely resonate with what you've stated um, and having conversations like these, the constant revisitation of where progress has been made, where conflict has existed, and what were the contributors to that? How were we able to, uh, again, display our organizational values at the YMCA, carrying honesty, respect, responsibility, and have that be a grounding for us in the fact that many different people from many different conflictive spaces have come together and created, in some cases, friendships with each other, in, uh, in other cases, a mutual respect of which they welcome each other in shared spaces. And so I, we all have to be optimistic, especially as things get tricky. And so I think the solidarity and lifting up in conversations like these are very helpful. Awesome. Alex. Yeah, I agree with what Dion and Linda said. I'd also say for me, it's just reminding myself why this is so important and finding opportunities when things are hard, as much as I possibly can, having that sounding board of support where I can just express and be super open because, right, I'm the type of person, like, I have to get that out, <laughs> you know, one way or another, right? Like, yeah. you know, and so I think just making sure that we as individuals have the kind of support, joy, balance in our lives, I think for me, mm -hmm. can go a really long way because there are moments where it's like, where it's hard, right? Um, and some leave the field, right? The field of philanthropy is a wacky field. <laughs> um, um, but it's it's keeping in mind why why I'm in it, why I'm in it. Um, and again, finding those places of support and joy to help yeah. offset any kind of difficulties or tension or conflict or mistakes right. or any of that stuff. That's right. That's the one we didn't talk about the keeping yourselves going as as the leader, the driver, and that's a great way to end this this call and and to keep the conversation encouraging those with you what's your supports where's your gratitude because the peaks and valleys and it's really in the valleys where um you could get frozen so what's that inertia to drive you forward and find your moments of joy to gian's point consistency everyone's watching and looking for inspiration as well as how do we keep moving forward sometimes just what do i do next is what helps people move forward. And then to Linda's point, revisit, 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 because the revisit finds that common place, can find that friendship at minimum, the mutual respect on the desired outcome we all want for people in our community. So just thank you so much for this hour. Thanks everyone for joining us and uh, talk to you soon. Bye.